Timothy Tell from the Foreign Policy Group. Mr. Secretary General, thank you for coming to us. This joint is packed with people committed to the OAS system. Uh, leave the commentary, leave the thanks, right. get to the question. What do, I, what, is, what do we do, those of us here who love the inter-American system and the democratic charter, how do we answer the bad guys here in town or around the world or on Capitol Hill that say this institution that we love and support has been taken over by, the, by Chavez, that we, that we are doing his bidding, that we're flying around in what some wags call Air Chavez, flying around in his planes instead of letting that asset go to the poor people of Venezuela. What do we do? Is it an image problem or do we have an institutional problem, Mr. Secretary General? I would say that uh, if you uh, <coughs> not, 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 very, not very far from today about, uh, about uh, oops, sorry. Sorry, sorry. About uh, two months ago, two, you know, not, not two, three months ago, you'll find President Chavez saying that he wants to leave the OAS because of some decisions by the Commission and the Court of Human Rights, which tends to show two things. First, that the OAS does act sometimes in situations that have to do with Venezuela and with, and with all countries in the region. So, or three things. Second, that there's, a, there's a still a certain movement to create something different from the, from the OAS, which I am sure will not, would not succeed. And uh, third, that President Chavez is not that big a fan of the OAS. And there are some things on record that shows that he's not a very, very big fan of the Secretary General. <laughs> but I very much agree with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Senator Kerry yesterday when he said that uh, the issue here is Honduras and not Venezuela. I mean, if you, if, if someone wants to discuss to discuss Venezuela or any other country or any other country in light of the Inter-American Democratic Charter, certainly he can do that. But it certainly it, that does not. I mean, I mean, it, it's not a uh, an issue now. I must admit, I must admit that being a member of the ALBA, uh, the ALBA. Other ALBA countries have taken the situation of Honduras very much at heart. And I have even spoken to some of them saying that they should remember that President Zelaya is supported by all the OAS, so that he's the OAS president and not an ALBA president. He's an OAS president. And I think that uh, uh, to some extent they have, may have overdone their support and make it appear as if this was their cause. This is not their cause. This is the cause of the whole region. Paul, go ahead. There's someone back there. That's a big crowd. Too big. Paul Tennessee, the University of District of Columbia. Secretary General, on whose behalf is President Arias negotiating? His government, the ALBA, the Rio Group, the State Department of the United States, and or the OAS? Well, I, I, I tended to say all the above, which is a good thing. <laughs> but, uh, but formally, uh, the negoc he's, he's negotiating as, uh, I mean, as a president of Costa Rica requested by the OAS and as the president of the Inter-American uh, Integration System. The SICA is one of the integration uh, uh, organizations that more that works uh, more regularly at the in 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 the, in the Americas, and President Arias, by pure coincidence, became a president of the SICA on the day after the coup in in Honduras. So I would I would not be fair if saying he's negotiating all only for the OAS. He's negotiating for the OAS and for SICA, which is the double role he has. And let me say one more thing. It is very common that we uh, ask personalities in the hemisphere to do that. In most of the crises we've had, we've had some relevant personality leading the effort, not the Secretary General. And uh, in, more, in all electoral missions, we also have a, a representative of the Secretary General who's a well-known personality. So this is, of course, this is, I would say, uh, 
uh, is, is, is particular case because of this of the uh, credentials of President Arias, but it's not an uh, it's not an unusual figure. Thank you, Sonia Schott, um, independent journalist. Mr. Secretary, what are the lessons to be learned after this crisis? And what about um, uh, conflict resolution mechanisms that the OIS is lacking of? Thank you. Uh, the first thing I would say is uh, uh, probably we should have, I mean, I have said that we did get involved in the crisis before it, uh, it became a military coup. But probably we should have done that before. And that was the first thing. I mean, our, we have a good early warning system. And uh, Victor Rico, our political secretary, is around there. And he would not like me not to recognize the quality of our early warning systems. But we should have. I mean, so we knew what was going on. Probably we, I should have made the decision to get involved before before the moment we did it, before not only not a week before, but several times, well, a long time before. But frankly, we all went to Honduras in the, at this at, for the General Assembly a month before, a month ahead. And even though there was a very strong political discussion, it was hard to imagine that that, that would happen a month later, I must admit that. Uh, and then uh, I think that, uh, look, the, the, the Democratic Charter I, I have addressed some of the shortcomings of the Democratic Charter, but I have to, to explain why they exist there, because it's a very clear compromise between uh, common democratic values and the respect for the principle of non-intervention. <laughs> Many countries are in, in the Americas, and I should say this has nothing to do with ideological matters, it, 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 it are very, very uh, strong-minded when it comes to finding any kind of mechanisms by which they will feel that the, can, that the OAS is intervening excessively in their affairs. I mean, so when, the, when the, the, the OAS cannot become, and it, I mean, there's concern that, that it, it, might, it can become at a certain point, point like the pro, a problem solver of, 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 uh, of governments in the region when we, what we have to do is to strengthen the development of, uh, the, 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 of institutions in the region. Uh, so I don't know if we, we, we should go further into creating some kind of a, a, problem, a, a conflict resolution mechanism. Actually, um, you know, uh, when I came to the OAS in, in 2005, there was a proposal for the creation of some panel to uh, implement the, the Inter-American Democratic Charter, and that was something like a Commission on Human Rights, but on democratic matters. And uh, it was soundly defeated in the, in the assembly. The countries didn't want to simply. Go ahead. Uh, one second, I think we got a microphone. Thank you. Uh, Ruben Barrera uh, with the Mexican News Agency, Notimex. Mr. Secretary, there is an element that has been conspicuously absent in the discussions in the OAS. That is the church. I wonder on the what point the fact that the church decided to take a side in this crisis, not only in some way justifying the uh, coup d'etat against President Salaya, but uh, warning that his uh, returning to Honduras could, you know, unleash uh, blood. Uh, uh, a bloody situation. I wonder to what point that had complicated or complicated the negotiation, not only for the OAS, but maybe for President Arias as well. Well, I would say that um, that uh, it was, uh, to, to, for me, it was a, uh, the, 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 the statement by the church was a, uh, fairly surprising. Because I met with the, with the uh, Cardinal uh, Rodriguez Madariaga, when I when, on my trip to Honduras on the on the 26th of, of June, and uh, he was very uh, very very cautious in saying, I mean, like separating two two things. 
One was his uh, general call to what you are mentioning now, to a call to a, to a, a peaceful solution, uh, no blood spilling, be, beware of confrontations, etc. I saw somebody from the Episcopal Conference of, the, of Honduras a couple of days ago repeating that message. I must admit that later, in the second part of the conversation, the Cardinal told me all what he thought about President Zelaya and his government. But I thought he had, he had been so careful in separating this because he, he told me also that he was going to have a meeting of the Episcopal Conference in the afternoon and he was going to, they were to, to, to issue a statement. So I left convinced that with the notion that, well, they were convinced that the, state, the statement would deal with the first part and not with the second. But the statement was actually a, a justification of the coup and a, a, a strong condemnation of the government. Of course, after that, there have been some, uh, some uh, other statements that have been interesting. This, uh, this uh, uh, speaker, this um, uh, bishop that was speaking on behalf of the whole conference said the other day that they were very ashamed of the way the president had been thrown out of the country, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I hope there's some kind of a review of that. I don't, I mean, I, I'm particularly not very fond of uh, churches taking political positions in that way, but I respect the right to do it. Uh, I would only hope that in this case they would help more to national pacification and not to national division. Let, let me ask one question that uh, has been bothering me a little bit, uh, if I can. Um, you su suggest very forcefully that the President Zelaya, the legitimate elected president, has to return to us, to Honduras to make this work. Uh, the question that, that uh, I've raised and uh, raise here again is, at what cost are we willing to pay to have him return? In other words, if it really does produce open violence in the country, if it produces a sort of deep, bitter polarization that's likely to endure for some time. In other words, is there some cost that we shouldn't be willing to pay under any... And this leads to the second part of the question. If, in fact, there is some kind of internal agreement, this is hypothetical, within the political forces in the country, that they agree to some kind of solution that doesn't include Zelaya, does that begin to sort of reestablish a political legitimacy? Well, actually, from my point of view, and I have to represent the council, and I have to represent the council and the assembly on this. No. I mean, this has to, this necessarily passes through the uh, reinstallation of the president on the conditions that, I mean, and as I said before, most of the president of the Americas couldn't care less about how that is done. And if there is a fourth box, if there's a referendum, there's no referendum, etc. But they want to see constitutional order reestablished. I don't think that's so difficult. After all, President Zelaya has only seven months to go in, in, in office. And he has said that he's very much willing to uh, call for all kinds of, uh, of, 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 of procedures to pacify the country. We are willing to have a mission there. We are willing to watch over that. So all, and we are willing to, 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 to sign on in all the guarantees that are necessary. But there are no other choices. I mean, yesterday there was a poll, the other day there was a poll showing that Celaya had about 30% of uh, support. Now there was a poll yesterday saying that Celaya had 48% of support. I don't care if he has 25, 38, or 96. I mean, he has to complete his term in accordance to the Honduran Constitution and nothing else. I don't like the Honduran Constitution particularly, but it's there. It's the Constitution. Many, some of these rigidities may have caused some of the problems, but that's the Constitution. It has to be respected. We are willing to uh, to, so, to uh, support that and to uh, and to uh, uh, verify that that's happening, but this has to. I mean, the, the original sin sin has to be 
has to be clear, 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 clear cleaned up. I mean, the, I, I, I mean, I'm not saying it. it, it I mean, I'm not talking here from the Honduran actors. I'm talking from here from the point of view of the presidents of the of the organization of American states, of the countries of the organization of American states. I don't think that they would put up for a for a solution that would leave the person that was deposed aside in in, in, in this situation. If it required military force. No, I don't think I don't think I'm I'm not in favor of that. No, I'm 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 very much against uh, all kind of, um, of of military intervention in any country for any reason. Not very, I'm very, very frank. I understand that. <laughs> There's always exceptions, of course. You can always say, "What? Well, what about Pol Pot? Yeah, okay, Pol Pot was, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> so. <laughs> but uh, but uh, <laughs> in normal cases, I am against. For a military intervention, I, I, and at least I don't think that the OAS can can do that. Gustavo Coronel from Venezuela. Uh, I think I know the reason why the Supreme Court of Ecuador couldn't get the attention of the OAS. Uh, they did not go on a hunger strike. <laughs> but my question is the following. Uh, I agree with you that a coup is a rape to democracy. My problem is, in Honduras, is who was the rapist? Uh, was it the National Congress and the Supreme Court? Or the president that tried to place himself above the Constitution? Well, let me say one thing which I... Uh, first, uh, by the way, I received the major before the hunger strike. I mean, he felt that the meeting was so successful that he, well, he could go on with a hunger strike. But I had a, I had a meeting with, with Antonio Ledesma in my office one week before he went in hunger strike and not after he went in hunger strike. And I said that I was going to, I was going to do the same things I've done for him, exactly the same I have done for him. Um, and I will receive him again. I understand he's coming again next week. He asked me for a meeting with the governors. I was willing to receive the governors. But if Mr. Ledesma wants to come back with them, that's, that's OK with me. Uh, now, uh, of course, there are in every country there are procedures by which uh, a president can, uh, can, I mean, can answer for uh, violating the Constitution. Let me say that it has been said very much that there is no impeachment procedure in the in the in the Honduran Constitution, which is true. But the Constitution does says that say that say this is one of the articulos petreos. The sittings has been that has been uh, in charge of the executive power cannot be elected, which means cannot be re-elected president or vice president of the republic. The one who breaks this disposition or proposes its reform. This could be called an attempt against this freedom of speech. I mean, anyone who proposes to reform this article, as well as those who support him directly or indirectly, will immediately cease in their respective charges, and we <coughs> and cannot hold them again for the next 10 years. And that is what the Articulo Spectre. So mean, the, mean, the clear meaning of this is you, I mean, there can be no re-election. <laughs> If you propose re-election <laughs> for 10 years, out for 10 years, and you are out immediately. Now, when I went to Honduras, as you know, I did meet with the Supreme Court. And they said that, uh, they told me, and I, I, I promise you, I found out at that moment, and you, you would have found out at that moment also, that there was a, a legal procedure against the president. <laughs> Uh, that uh, had begun when the national prosecutor had asked the Supreme Court Wednesday or Thursday to start this procedure. But he already had all the documents, uh, several charges against the president. The court had named and appointed secretly, because there was a request of secrecy, a judge on, Wednesday, on Friday. And on Friday, the judge had issued an, a warrant for the arrest of the president. 
And of course, the military went to arrest him. Not the police, the military went to arrest him on Sunday morning. And for some reason, they decided to throw him out of the country instead. There's an article, by the way, in the Constitution that says that no Honduran can be expatriated. Article 102 of the Honduran Constitution. So my only question was, uh, but on, on, on what grounds? Well, he said, uh, I mean, some of this, there was some, was there some rule, some, uh, some uh, decision, some court decision? No, no, no. He had ceased in his in his charge. He said, but, but somebody has to declare that. I mean, I mean, I can't go into your office, Mr. President. I told the president of the Supreme Court, and tell him, tell you, you ceased. I mean, somebody has to declare that you ceased. Why didn't the Congress declare that? Why didn't the Supreme Court declare that? They had the possibility of saying it. They had the Constitution to say it. Instead, they decided for the rape. That's the, 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 the original sin. There, I mean, there are, there are ways. I don't like that. I mean, I don't like the, what goes on in some countries in which they find procedures to, to send the president off. In some countries, it's very easy to send the president off. That's a problem of, uh, I mean, probably they should have a, they should have a, a parliamentary government in which they can throw the prime minister off without any kind of, of scandal. I don't like that. But the procedures exist. If the Congress of Honduras had met that Sunday evening uh, and uh, decided that the president had ceased in his functions, well, maybe we wouldn't have liked it, but uh, it's, and we, have, we would have a big discussion. But it wouldn't be the big discussion we're having now. It would be different. Did they have the right to do it, et cetera, et cetera. And somebody would be calling this a coup. And somebody would say, no, it's not a coup. Now, in this case, everybody says it's a coup because it happened in the way coups happen. Now, why? I have only one explanation, but it's my explanation. Because after the president had the problem with the Supreme Court and the and the, and the head of the army, the Congress met until 5 o'clock in the morning. And they couldn't agree on that. They, but they did agree on Sunday afternoon after the president was out of the country and the military were in charge. That is a military coup. That is the rape. It's not that there were procedures to do it. The Constitution does not provide the president of immunity, does not provide him with immunity. Another thing that's probably a rarity, the president doesn't have any immunity. He can be arrested as any other citizen. So the court could have been arrested and put to trial. But they decide, I mean, you have to ask them why they did that. That's what they have decided to decide. The president was uh, doing something that was illegal according to some people, according to himself, not. But that could be discussed in, in different uh, places. Nobody can take, nobody so much above the law that he can take the law in his hands. Yes, sir. David? Mr. Secretary General, um, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Um, what happens if if Celaya does not go back? How does Honduras get back into the inter-American family? Uh, I, I, I would say that's a difficulty because, as you know, uh, there are two. I should mention two things. According to the charter. I mean, I think that it's not provided exactly that way, but things are undone in the, way, the same way they are done. And the Charter requires uh, two-thirds of the Council of the, of the Assembly to suspend the country. So we must assume that it requires two-thirds of the Assembly to restore the country. Uh, one could also, I, could also, I, should, I should also mention that in general in the OES we like to do things by consensus. So probably in the case of Honduras, we took a vote because the charter very clear mandates a vote. So we had to be hand, raise hands and all that. But I am pretty sure that if eight or nine countries would have, wouldn't have wanted that, even if we had two thirds, we probably wouldn't have voted. And we would have suspended. We would not have suspended. What will happen afterwards? I mean, if, if Honduras doesn't, doesn't uh, if, if there are no, uh, 
no uh, no restoration of the president if they have an election and then they come back and say look we have an election why don't you restore our rights i'm not really sure i i have to to admit that i think that some countries would not agree in the in the restoration of honduras in those conditions <coughs> Nora? Nora Lustig. Actually, my question is more for Peter than for uh, Jose Miguel. Uh, I think that there is consensus that there has been a violation of democracy and that there's, there was a coup in Honduras. So I'm a little puzzled by the uh, sort of questioning of uh, the OAS having taken a strong stance vis-a-vis -vis what happened in Honduras if I understood correctly some of your, your comments and questions. And also, uh, why are we worried about the cause? I mean, I think the signal has to be quite forcefully that this is unacceptable. Uh, given the checkered history of Latin America with the democracy, I think that we have to be very careful in giving in, even though at some point it might seem that, well, maybe this guy wasn't that good, but, you know, he wanted to sort of perpetuate himself, maybe this and maybe that. I think that the message from the inter-American community, from all of those of us who work on Latin America, who have been witnessed and lived through uh, governments de facto, should be a very clear signal, this is unacceptable, and you know, let's do something else. Let's move on, let's try to work it out, but this is unacceptable. So you know, my question to you is, I sense that in some of your questions, <coughs> there was some you know, tolerance, given that the cost may be too high if you are intolerant vis-a-vis -vis what's happening now in, in Honduras. Uh, I don't want to take time away from the Secretary General. Let me just make one, uh, one point. I think politics is really the art of the possible. And certainly in situations where you're going to lead to bloodshed and violence, uh, then you have to take very seriously into account what the limitations are. The Secretary General himself has said that he would not advise any kind of military action, for example, which would be the extreme case. And secondly, the fact is it's a little, lot easier to make an example of a small country like Honduras than if something like this happened in a large country like Mexico or Brazil, for example. So with that, that's, that's why I think uh, 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 the questions are being raised, and uh, believe me, I know uh, what to use to generate a good conversation, or so you'll have to ask me personally what I think, not sort of interpret it from my question. Please. No, no, I just want to say, I mean, some of the things you have said are true. But first, I don't see why, why so many people so concerned about the bloodshed in Honduras, where there has been practically no bloodshed, even in spite of, the, of what happened with the with President Zelaya, and of course those flights of, over the, the airport were really very spectacular, and one person unfortunately got killed. But uh, uh, there was not no real, uh, there was no real fighting in the streets. When I went to Honduras, I had a very interesting experience. Uh, I, I was going to hold my meetings at the OAS uh, uh, headquarters in Honduras, which is in kind of a narrow street. It's uh, about two blocks, I mean, very, very narrow, and with the houses in the, the borders of the street. So I turned the corner, and I found and the, the people, the, the police that were going with me, were very upset by this. They, there was a, I mean, cry, an immense crowd was there of people who supported President Zelaya, by the way. And I said, look, I can't hold any meetings in here. I'll please go, go ahead. Let's plow into the crowd and into the crowd and go out the other way and go someplace else. So we did. And the people were very much on top of the car. And the policemen that were guarding me were, I mean, I mean with their backs on the car, trying to hold them back. And they, I mean, it was a difficult situation, but there was absolutely no violence. Absolutely no violence. Anita was there with me. They opened the windows, and the people threw their papers inside the windows, and nobody wanted to, to pick a fight. And if you saw the, the, 
the, the, the, the, the pictures of the of the of the, uh, of the events on, the, on on Sunday when President Zelaya wants to return, there was no violent mood from anyone. And well, of course, there was, of course, it's through uh, gas uh, and all the other things. But uh, I mean, so I'm not really that concerned about violence erupting and people killing themselves in Honduras. Honduras had um, some participation in the wars of Central America, but the, there was no guerrilla in Honduras, a very small one. So it, Honduras is a very peaceful country. I don't see the, that much of a concern. I think violence was, I, I think that the, 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 the pretext for, for the coup, we wanted to avoid bloodshed, was no, we wanted to force Congress to do it. The Congress decided not to do it on Thursday, and then after the coup, they decided to do it on Sunday. And by the way, several ambassadors can tell you that the president of the Supreme Court didn't know what was going on on Sunday. And then today, a few days later, he was willing to say that no, that we're very much on top of things, and that they had um, issued the orders for all this to happen. No, this was as usually happened with coup. And people who are, I mean, to accept, I mean, maybe they, they didn't want the president and all that, or they have to accept what happened, so they accommodate their attitude so, to the ruling, to the, to the rulers. The rulers of Honduras are military, that's a fact. Good morning, thank you for your discussion. Let me, let me ask you a question. It's been running through my mind as you've been talking. I understand the background you gave. I'm not quarreling with most of your reasoning. But is, it, is the difference here the military? You have a case, for example, in Bolivia where street people forced the president out of office and he had to flee because he feared for his life. Nothing was done. Is that because there was no military involved? Well, actually, uh, let me say this. I j just arrived at the at the uh, at the o at the secretariat of the OAS when President Mesa resigned. I assume you are talking about uh, about President Sanchez de los Well, I was not secretary general of the OAS at that moment, but of course he had the choice of resorting to the Inter-American Democratic Charter. From my point of view, a coup given by the military or a coup given by the masses has exactly the same, the same, is exactly the same thing. I don't believe that you can say, as someone said in Latin America, not very far, not very long ago, we have created a new democratic procedure. When the presidents don't like, when the, the, the masses don't like their leaders, they go out into the streets and throw them out. I don't believe in that either. I think that something should have been done in that case. And I'm, 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 but, but I understand President Sanchez de Rosada decided to to resign instead. Uh, but uh, so, so the, so the, 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 the coup can be given in, in several different ways. Uh, and uh, thank you for saying that, because there's a lot of things that the people that are very, have become lately very sympathetic to coups. And maybe they should remember that it can go both ways. So maybe we should take, uh, and if going back to what Nora said, I think it was uh, George Kennan who said that uh, when things are really complicated and you don't know what exactly what, what you could do, it's not a bad thing to resort to principles. I think that this is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, this was a moment in which, uh, this is not a matter of politics, either. that's probably our, our disagreement. For us it's not a matter of politics, it's a matter of principles. And I must be the most pragmatic politician that have passed, uh, passed, passed through Chile, in Chile for a long time. But I think that sometimes you have to start by principle. Not, not that often, because you, 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 can't just, uh, you can't just go around with principles of this way, no, no. But when things are really rough, then you go back to principle. I think that's, uh, that's, that's what you have to do. Thank you. I'm Samantha Lada from the Council of the Americas. I just have a question since it's 
I guess, been established and reinstated over and over again that Zelaya will be put back in power no matter what. What is going to be done to address once he's come back to power? I know elections are coming up in a couple months, you said. What's going to be done to make, make sure he doesn't try to perpetuate himself in power again or to make sure that elections are carried out fair, free, and completely in legal ways that, you know, his successor isn't, like, rigged and put into power or anything, just to make sure that everything's carried out well, even if he's not the one in power, someone isn't doing his bidding. Well, the only concern uh, that we had uh, on this battle that we have on this battle was actually, it was, uh, as I said before, the candidates were there. The candidates are still there, by the way, and they are trying to run for office. Uh, the, and, the, and the Electoral Council is in charge of the elections, and according to the Honduras uh, constitutional law, the rest of the powers don't have, a, don't have that much to do. But uh, we have to make, I mean, probably some, um, something could be agreed in advance for the funding of the elections, just to make sure that there's no possibility of stopping them. But then we hope that uh, all this, um, the culmination of this, is some kind of uh, an international supervision of the, of the process until the, the election. I, I, I don't think that President Zelaya has ever wanted to meddle with the elections. But if, in case somebody wants to, to, make that, that, to make sure of that, you can always ask for the, to, to include some kind of international observation uh, two or three months before the election, as we have done it in several countries before. We did it in Bolivia, for example. I mean, for example, we had a, a mission in Bolivia for spent some time. In Nicaragua, for the presidential election, we had a mission for about four months before the election. So that can be also done. Hugo Noé Pino, en a Honduran citizen. Uh, Mr. Ensulza, what knowledge does the OAS have uh, about human rights in Honduras in the last three weeks? Yesterday we heard uh, terrible news about Jerry Dixon's family, one of the lawyers who is uh, uh, speaking to different groups uh, in Washington. Uh, I, I can't answer that question today, maybe a couple of days from now, because actually the Commission on Human Rights is probably going to go to, to Honduras in the next, uh, the next weeks. They, have, they, have, uh, they, they said they wanted to go. They can go even in spite of the suspension, because the, the, the charter pro specifically provides that the suspended country has to, has to, to, uh, to fulfill all its commitments in matters of human rights. So we're going to have a report on that. And the report of that has to tell us things that we don't know. How many people are in jail after the, the coup? Who's, who's, what are, what are threats to personal integrity have that been, et cetera, et cetera. I cannot really answer those questions, but I think that our Commission on Human Rights, as you know, is working very strongly on these matters. Thank you, uh, Silvia Yusuf from the German Press Agency. Mr. Insulza, I had the sense uh, in the past weeks that, the, this, uh, that there was a sense of urgency for solving the crisis. Now, yesterday you were asking at the Permanent Council of the OAS, the, the countries, to stay calm and asking for how much time, uh, for, for patience. So, how much time does Mr. Arias have, do you think, to, solve, to, to reach any kind of agreement? And if it doesn't happen that way, do you have any kind of plan B? According to you, you don't want a military intervention. So, so what would be another plan? Thank you. Um, well, first, uh, not all the time in the world, because uh, uh, as you know, we have elections in five months. And uh, with one scenario we don't want to have is uh, an election without, without with, the, with, the, with the de facto president there. That would be unacceptable. <laughs> Uh, but I think that when I say I mean, we have to have patience because we have something that's going on on Saturday. Let's not start talking about options on Wednesday when we have a, pro a, a discussion on Saturday. And I think some people are getting a little bit restless, and that's not a good, uh, good thing. I mean, we have to keep uh, very strongly the pressure against the, 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 the facto government, and that's 
that's our, our, our largest strength. What else can we do? Well, I think that it's very hard for a government to stay for a long time or to, to, to stand for a, for a prolonged pressure as the one we are exercising now. There are loans that are suspended in the international organizations. And there are several programs that have put on hold. There are some inst only some institutional institu international institutions remain in the countries, but they are not uh, uh, carrying out their programs. And Honduras is, uh, is, is, is beginning to suffer for that, and I hate to, I hate to, to, to say this. Somebody said yesterday in council, okay, but we should make sure that uh, the, the ordinary people don't suffer with it. That's impossible. I mean, that's, that's impossible. If you, if you stop a program, let me just give you one of ours. I mean, if, uh, if, we, if you stop, and we did stop, a, a project for, uh, for the rehabilitation of drug addicts, of course those people do suffer the, the consequences. So at a certain point, it has, something has to, has to happen. I'm very hopeful that it happens. I'm not, I'm not asking for patience in the sense of letting this go for several weeks. I'm just asking for patience until President Arias be, uh, uh, ends his, his, his part. What to do? Well, I will have to decide. We will have to decide what to do. I mean, the one, the one who has the mandate from the General Assembly is, is I, I am the one who has the mandate for the, for the General Assembly. So if President Arias mediation or negotiation or dialogue, whatever you want to call it, doesn't work, we will have to do what, what act we, we to see what action we have take. We have some options, but please, I don't want to, to go into that now. Thank you. I am Francisco Villagran, Ambassador of Guatemala. My question was uh, along the same lines, but I would like to say two things. One is uh, related to the article of the Constitution that the Secretary General mentioned. The Guatemalan Constitution has a similar article. And these articles were drafted precisely to prevent the return of dictators. That is the purpose. They were drafted with these new constitutions 20 years ago. And the idea was that we wouldn't have to return to, uh, to dictators. Uh, I want to say something else. Um, we support President Zelaya. We want to see him restored to office, but through peaceful means, not through the use of force. And that is why we support the mediation of President Arias. Uh, I'm very glad that the Secretary General has explained the nature of the mandate and the relationship between his mandate and the Organization of American States. He also has a mandate from the Central American presidents as head of SICA. So we don't question his credentials. We support him. We want him to succeed, and above all, we don't want to see uh, the use of force uh, in our region for any reason uh, that would be related to a constitutional crisis. Thank you. When can we get you back here? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Thank you. Thank you.